Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to part three of episode four. Now, in the last episode, I provided insight into how the police looked for and lifted fingerprints at the crime scene, and how Superintendent Bartholomew used fuming and then hydrant to expand the search for fingerprints. I've described the process of recording and documentation that Swartz meticulously followed at the crime scene under the supervision of Su Superintendent Bartholomew particularly as it relates to Folion 1. And I've also showed how quickly these prints were run through the AFA system and that there were unfortunately no hits. Uh, I've also pointed out how the judge unfairly criticized and had unreasonable expectations of the police that they should have had the foresight to know that the lift taken from the DVD would become critically important later in the case. By presenting the results of the autopsy, we got good insight into the brutality of the crime. And then I took the judge to task when he assumed without any corroborating evidence presented by an expert in court, that such a crime could not be premeditated. An expert would have been able to explain to the court the concept of premeditated anger and that every premeditated murder exposes the cruelty of the offender. Therefore, the more brutal the murder, the more cruel the offender. But now let's get back to part three. So sometime after Fred's interview with Neville De Beer early that morning, Captain Raymond Peterson, the same detective that took over from Constable Adams, and who was asked by Neville De Beer to pick Fred up from the lot's home for questioning, he went to the video place where Inga rented the video. And he wanted to find out from them if Inge was alone that day or did she come into the video place with someone else. Unfortunately, the people that worked in the 16th were on duty and they couldn't provide any assistance to him. I also know that sometime on the 17th, the police also had an interview with Wimpy Bosso, most likely to ask him about his movements for the day and to determine whether Inge had any plans to see someone else later that, that afternoon. Now it seemed to me that Wimpy did the investigation a great disservice by not mentioning to the police nor the private investigators that Inga told him about the hell of a fight that she had to fret that morning. Instead, he told the private investigators that Inga and Fred's relationship was perfect and that she was hoping to get engaged to Fred in 2006. And I assume that's what he also told the police. Uh, Wimpy did a formal statement and gave his fingerprints to Inspector de Villiers on April the 9th at the Bishop Labour's police station. And here it is, and as you can see, it is completely short and useless. Ram clear the formal statement and gave fingerprints to Inspector de Villiers on April the 12th at about 6.30 in the evening. Maris Buerta also on the 12th at about quarter past two. Now Fred originally had an appointment with Inspector de Villiers to make his statement and to provide his fingerprints on March the 30th. However, de Villiers cancelled the meeting after Fred already arrived at the venue. Now we know that on this date, the Villiers uh, interviewed Marius Butter at the flat in Anfield Village. And this was two days after the private investigator asked the Villiers to get a, a search warrant to search the flat in order to find this diary with the curse in. So I assume that is what the Villiers wanted to talk to Marius Butter about. So after the Villiers canceled the appointment with Fred, Fred called four times on March the 30th, probably uh, after uh, the, the meeting got cancelled. He also called the next day on the 31st. Again, he called on April the 8th and in the morning of April the 12th. Eventually, Fred went in to Bishop Levis in the afternoon of the 12th and he made a statement and gave his fingerprints to uh, Senior Inspector Miller. And these here are the prints, the prints that were taken from Fred. 
In his statement, Fred makes no mention of the disagreement and argument between him and Inge. And he mentioned that Inge gave him a, a briefly, a little letter, not the use of the singular. And he said that the content of the letter was positive. He also said that after getting worried about Inge, he called Inge's mother, who also said that she couldn't get hold of Inge. But that is not true, and phone records can, can substantiate it. Up to the time that Fred called Mrs. Lotz, she did not try to get hold of Inge. She knew that Inge was studying, and as per the usual routine, uh, she was waiting for Inge to initiate contact when she was done studying or she wanted to take a break. So after all the fingerprints were taken from Fred and Bram and Marius on the 12th, all the fingerprints collected over the course of the investigation, including the prints from Christo Pretorius and crime scene officers that were at the crime scene were given to Bartholomew. He then in turn gave the prints to Captain Yanni Bester, a fingerprint expert, to compare them against 11 lifts that Schwartz took from the crime scene. Now, likely because of the unflattering way the private investigators portrayed Marius Butter, Superintendent Bartholomew was particularly interested to learn whether the print found in the wash basin belonged to Marius. However, he was surprised to find out that it was from Fred von der Pfeiffer. Fred's prints were also found on the security gate and the DVD cover. The prints on the tall drinking glass that we saw on the table belonged to Inge, and the remaining prints could not be matched to anyone. The next day, Inspector de Villiers went to the video place where Inge rented the DVD, and he took a photo of the rental record on the computer screen. It showed that the DVD was taken out at 7 minutes past 3 that afternoon, just a few hours before Inge's death. Now, for Fred's fingerprints to be on a DVD is critically important here, because it means that Fred must have been in Inge's presence after 7 past 3 that afternoon, at the time when he said he was at work. So if his fingerprints was on a DVD, then his alibi is false. Obviously, this fingerprint was extremely incriminating evidence and enough reason to consider Fred a prime suspect, to issue an arrest warrant, and in my opinion, enough to obtain a conviction. And in the next episode, we will look at how the police proceeded with their investigation after they found his fingerprint, and how they collected further evidence against Fred. However, between the initial interview and Fred's statement on the 12th, the police paid Fred little attention, certainly no more attention than other people, like for example, Marius Butter. Now, it is common knowledge and well established in research that in the vast majority of cases where a woman is murdered, the perpetrator is someone well known to the victim, a romantic partner, a husband, a boyfriend, family or friends, colleagues. And when we look at this particular murder, there were no signs of a break-in, no signs of burglary or sexual assault, uh, that the person was let into the flat. Uh, when we consider all these things together, the probability that the murder was committed by a very close person to Inge becomes almost certain. And objectively and statistically speaking, if we look at Inge's circle of family and friends, who should the police have considered the prime suspect right from the onset? Obviously, the boyfriend, Fred van der Pfeiffer. I'm not saying that he should have been considered the only suspect. Uh, Marius, previous boyfriends like Bram Krier, and friends like Wimpy were all legitimate suspects and warranted further investigation. However, an investigation must start somewhere and what better place to start with the prime suspect? Until enough evidence is collected to either charge the person or to exonerate the person. And yet the police did not treat Fred like a suspect at all. They were not interested in him. They did not follow up on his alibi. They did not speak to Shiana Tofi. 
nor anyone at Old Mutual. To the best of my knowledge, and I'm not sure about the legality of this, however, but the police did not show a photo of him nor his vehicle around the Shiraz and the surrounding complexes on the 17th to determine if anyone has seen him or his vehicle there the previous day, nor did they do this with any other potential suspect. The police could have taken a sworn statement and his fingerprints right there that morning of the 17th when they had him at the Bishop Levis police station, but they didn't, they just let him go and didn't follow up on anything he told them. Also know that the police only obtained his phone records in August 2006, more than a year later. And we know how important phone records are to corroborate movements on any particular day. Does this look like tunnel vision? I don't think so. But it seems that the police to some extent relied on the private investigators to interview and to investigate Inga's friends, family, etc. in order to identify potential suspects. Now, according to a report compiled by the private investigators dated April the 10th, and which was made available to the police on the 11th, uh, the private investigators conducted interviews with the following people. Yes, uh, Professor Lotz, Mrs. Juanita Lotz, Ian Mayberg, in, uh, Inge's uncle, Louis van der Feyfer, Brett's father, Brett van der Feyfer, Wimpy Borsov, Maris Bota, Ram Krier, and then two people whose names I'm not going to reveal fully in order to protect their privacy, Frederick T. and Johan B. So this report identified the following suspects. Marius Bota, Yuan B, Ram Krier, Nicholas A, Pumpy Bosov, and Anton W. Now, Brown Krier and Nicholas A were considered suspects because they were both previous boyfriends of Inga's and whose relationship with her did not end well. Brown was supposedly highly traumatized by the breakup and Nicholas's ego was hurt. In addition, based on what these investigators have been told, mostly by Fred, they thought that Ram and Nicholas both had unstable personalities and were prone to brutality. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please don't take these assessments as accurate or the truth. No psychological assessments were done. In fact, investigators didn't even interview Nicholas. Now, the other individuals, Yuan B, Anton W, they were looked at, and I'm pretty sure that their uh, alibis checked out, and there were no further attention paid to them. Marius Buta was considered a suspect for the following reasons. He had no alibi for what he did between 3.48, when he left Old Mitchell after the meeting, and 20 past 6 when Fred arrived back at the flat. Now it should also be noted that neither are there any evidence whatsoever, like an eyewitness or video footage or cell phone records or any forensic evidence that proves that his alibi is false. They also considered him a suspect because he refused to do a lie detector test and to provide his fingerprints. Now, according to Marius, he did not refuse to do a polygraph test. He indicated that he first wanted to talk to his attorney about it. Now, refusing to do a lie detecting, a lie detector test is a smart thing to do and should not be held against him in any way. Ladies and gentlemen, never ever agree to do a lie detector test to prove you're innocent, even if you know that you're innocent. There are too many cases of positive, false positive, results, and this can cause you a, a, a lot of unnecessary grief. And also, throughout the course of this investigation, Marius provided fingerprints, hair samples, and a blood sample. So I'm not sure why these uh, investigators said that uh, Marius refused to provide his fingerprints. He's also considered a suspect because according to witnesses, in other words, Fred, Marius mentioned that Inga was murdered, whilst evidence indicated that he was told she committed suicide. 
Now, we spoke about this before, and we know that Christo told him suicide to start off with. And after Marius asked some question, Christo said that it could be murder as well. And then Marius said that he told Brett that he was not certain what happened, but that it could be murder or suicide. So ultimately, we have Brett's word against Marius's word, and we know which side the private investigators played. So during the, they also thought that Marius during the cross-examination was very well prepared and they found that suspicious. And they also thought that Marius displayed an arrogant stance with little cooperation. Now Marius denies this. Uh, he said he was always cooperative and answered all the questions to the best of his ability. And then also thought of been as a suspect because Marius was in love with Inger and incredibly jealous of Fred and that he even put a curse over them. Now Marius admitted that he was in love with Inger during their first year and we know that subsequent to that Marius had a relationship with other women. Marius admitted that after finding out about her and Fred's relationship that he told Inger that their friendship would never be the same again. In a later police statement, he clarified that he told Inge that since he was in a serious relationship with Fred, that it would not be appropriate for them to hang out like they did before. And he did this out of respect for Inge and Fred's relationship. Therefore, to use the word incredibly is a bit of a stretch. In a sworn statement, Marius said that he wasn't jealous of Fred and Inge. He was rather jealous of Fred's academic achievements and that he channeled these feelings of jealousy to motivate him to study harder. In a previous episode, I explained how Marius voluntarily moved out of the apartment so that Fred's parents could stay there. And while they were there, they rifled through Marius' belongings and read through his diaries and found an entry where Marius asked for God's forgiveness for a curse he had spoken over Fred and Inge. This diary was removed, photocopies were made and the diary was returned to its normal location. Now on March 28, uh, Louis van der Pfeiffer uh, informed a private investigator of what he found and he gave him a photocopy of the diary entry at some stage. So at this point, the investigator was in possession of material that was obtained illegally and without a proper search warrant. So this investigator then contacted Inspector de Villiers and asked him to obtain a search warrant. So I guess to legally find this diary with an entry about the curse. It does not appear as if Inspector de Villiers reacted to this request. We do know that police eventually obtained a photocopy of the diary but never the original and they used this photocopy to confront Marius with it and, and that was the first time that Marius came to realize how his privacy was violated but it did not end there it seems that someone most likely someone in the front of favor camp leaked the story about the curse to the media and this was long after Fred officially became the prime suspect because of the fingerprint evidence that put him in Inge's presence the afternoon of her murder. So here's the article and it reads, The curse is mentioned in documents that form an important part of the police investigation into the murder, which still has the police none the wiser after six weeks. A report saw an extract of the document containing the curse. Forgive me for cursing Fred and Inga, it says. Fred van der Pfeiffer was Lotte's steady boyfriend. The name of the friend who cursed the couple is known to report, but is being withheld on legal advice. Now let me do what the police should have done, what a private investigator should have done, and what this journalist should have done. And let's look what is behind this so-called curse. So when we hear the word curse, we conjure up images of Satanists and occultists, witches, demons and practitioners of the dark arts. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We have to remember that Marius was a devout member of an evangelical church. 
and that the His People Church and churches like these believe in the power of spoken blessings and spoken curses. A spoken blessing is when you say something good to or about someone. For example, you are so clever or he is so talented. A spoken curse, on the other hand, is when you say something negative to or about someone. It's believed that sometimes an evil spirit can attach itself to such a curse, which in turn can bring great harm to a person. Sometimes the impact of a curse can be generational, passed from parent to child, to grandchildren and so on. In most cases, a person is not even aware that what he or she said is a spoken curse that can have long-lasting consequences. Here are just a few examples. You will never be successful. You are going to get killed in that car. You are not smart enough to work here. You will never find another man like me. Now, in a statement to the police, uh, Marius provided the following explanation for the curse. So in early 2005, he attended the Bible or church seminar. And during the seminar, there was a discussion about different types of curses. There was a discussion about spoken cur curses, the power of the tongue, and how one must always be careful of what one say. Marius felt guilty about gossiping about Fred and Inga to his friend Sylvia Strauss, when he questioned as to why they were keeping their relationship a secret from him. As discussed before, Marius was very upset about this, about the fact that these two people, which he considered friends, kept something so important from him. And this is what Marius considered a spoken curse, and that is what he asked for forgiveness in his diary. He didn't mean it as a curse. He didn't know it was a spoken curse at the time that he said it. He came to realize it afterwards during the seminar. Then he wanted God to forgive him. That sounds pretty good to me. However, before we go back to the list of suspects and talk about the elephant in the room, I just quickly want to talk about Inga's long letter. We know that on the morning of the 16th, the day after the murder, Inga wrote a two-page letter to Fred, which she gave to him after his class. Now we know that this letter clearly indicates that, that there had been some kind of disagreement between Fred and Inga, and that the letter was an attempt to smooth things over with him. We also know there are references in there that Inga was afraid that Fred may dump her because of her father's supposed drinking. And we also know that Mrs. Lotz asked that she could see this letter the morning of the 17th, and instead Fred showed her a shorter, undated note, the kind of which Inga would typically give Fred on a Sunday afternoon. Fred said he wanted to protect the Lotzes from being hurt about Inga's reference to their drinking. Now, on March the 29th, the day after Louis van der Feyfer told the investigators about the curse found in Marius's diary, Fred thought it was time to give the letter to the private investigators, at least a copy of the letter to the private investigators, along with the following note. Hello, Wim. Here is the letter I spoke about. Wim can read it to see if it is of any value. I doubt it, but I don't want to withhold anything. The letter is very personal and I appreciate it if it didn't get into too many people's hands. But do whatever you have for the investigation. Call me if Wim has any questions about the letter or anything else. Best of everything, I'm praying for you, Fred. P.S. The most important thing is that the paragraph about the father on the first page must please not get to Wim Yan, if at all possible. Thank you. Now, someone like Anthony Altbeker may be gullible enough to fall for Fred's act. I don't. Not at all. In his book, Altbeker argues in favor of Fred because Fred chose to give the letter to the private investigators instead of disposing of it, throwing it away or burning it. But in another episode, I will explain why this would have been a big mistake. 
has already very early on in, in the investigation, Fred told people that he had two letters. And it would have been very suspicious if one of these letters just suddenly disappeared. Now, it seems like the private investigator heeded Fred's request and never showed the letter to the paying client, Professor Lodge. Nor do they make any references of this letter in their report. It does, however, appear that the letter at some states was given to the police because on April the 9th, Director Ati Trollope, a senior police officer who got involved with the investigation at that time, met with Mrs. Lodge and showed her the letter. And that was the first time that she saw it. Now back to the list of suspects. What is wrong with this list? We can see Vimpy is here, purely on a basis that he was close to Inga, and for no other reason. He was one of Inga's best friends, and for that, he was a suspect. But Fred Philip Pfeiffer was even closer to Inga, the person whom Inga wanted to marry and spend the rest of her life with. He is not on this list. The same person that told an investigator that he has forgiven Inga for what she has said to him, prompting the investigator to tell Professor Lotz that he thought that this person murdered Inga. This person is not on the list. The same person that received a letter from Inga on the morning of the day of her murder that indicated that there was an argument and a disagreement between them and an unhealthy relationship dynamic, this person is not on the list, but Vimpy is. And it gets even worse. Fred, Fred gets pulled into assisting the investigators with their investigation. As I mentioned before, they used uh, Fred to enter uh, Inga's phone records into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Also, according to Marius, after they resumed living uh, in the flat again, uh, Fred would often leave and saying that he was going out to help the private investigators with their investigation. And in a sworn statement, Marius told Director Ati Trollop that one of the private investigators told him that he knew Louis van der Pfeiffer from his days in Queenstown and that since the start of the investigation, they had regular contact with Fred's father, Louis van der Pfeiffer. Now, I'm not normally a conspiracy theorist, but this reeks of a conspiracy to shield Fred. I sense a puppet master behind the scenes pulling the strings to get the investigators to produce a report that omits important information that contains false, misleading, and unsubstantiated information, mostly about Marius, that eliminates Fred as a suspect and shifts the focus to Marius Bota. No wonder the lots has fired these investigators, but more about that in the next episode. Now that's all for episode four, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Please be sure to press the subscribe button. As always, your support is appreciated. So when Fred fingerprints were found on a DVD holder, he became a legitimate suspect and nobody can or should fault the police for shifting their investigation to focus on Fred. And that is what we will look at in the next episode. But you will also learn that the police did not immediately stop their investigation into other suspects. Until then, stay tuned. Thank you.